Do do chick do do. That's the angle. Do do. What? Do do. That's the podcast. All right, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to that's the angle, and I'm here with Kelly Tolsman. How you doing? I'm actually beautiful. I'm doing really well. You looking beautiful over there in your wife beater. Some nice art behind you. <laughs> yeah, I, it's actually a duo called Fail. They're yeah. based out of uh, New York. They're amazing. They're monsters. They're, they slay walls. So yeah. Yeah, look, sit here. I'm just turning my headphones up a little bit. Okay. Oh, I think I just muted myself. But uh, yeah, man, freaking, how's, how's this quarantine been treating you, man? Have you been uh, staying productive or have you been just like, like... Immensely, actually. I've been really, really productive. I think uh, for most artists, everybody is used to being like almost quarantined, like in the studio for like 10, 12 hours a day by yourself. And like you're contemplating which which color blue you hate or like, you know, whatever. So, but I think it's, it's, uh, I'm used to it. And my family, like we really hustled hard all the time. Um, and it was just when it was the end of school, my son just started basically homeschooling with me for the most part. And then my wife would take him on the other days and yeah, we just made it happen. Um, I'll yeah, I, I, I feel you on that, man. It's like the quarantine. It's like, welcome to the artist's life. It's like telling everyone, it's like, welcome to our life now of like sitting inside, debating on what your project you're going to do, what you're going to work on today, what different sort of ideas you got to go through. Yeah. I'll be surprised if there's not like 500 solo shows or like 52 million albums that come out or anything like that. Because like, like just secluding yourself and like pondering yourself a lot. And like, especially during these crazy days, like trying to have an outlet. I think is the hardest thing for other people, uh, but not for artists. So like, it's just like, now you have a set track and you, you know what you want to do. And there was a little bit during the first month or two that I just like experimented and play with stuff. But right after that, it was just make, 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 make. So yeah, I feel you, man. I feel like everyone was just trying to figure it out for the first month or two. But then after that, most artists I know were just kind of like, let's kick this shit in a high gear. That way when it's over, we're so ready to, to like, produce some more shows to be a part of things and to really put on yeah they always say i think it's it's a, a a history thing where they say in times of crisis or in times of war and times of like real real crazy days like that is when the most creative comes out and especially for even like like med- medicine like look how like quickly they're trying to get a vaccine on it supposedly takes years to normally yeah, get right? stuff. yeah so like but i i feel in most apartments like people just really like learn how to bake <laughs> they learn how to have a green thumb. They learn Everyone's how to become everything. domesticated. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's kind of brilliant because like, if you think about it, like most people like didn't have those skills to be with and they were just like do everyday life and go to like, you know, Safeway and pick a bread or whatever. And then now it turned into, well, I'm going to learn how to make sourdough. And it was just like, like <laughs> these things just went crazy. But it's good. I think that's creative. And I think that's like, that was the outlet for regular people, not regular people, people without the, the creative job of being an artist and things of that nature. They just like found those creative outlets and, and took them under control. So, the, you know, I, I like that. I have a very positive attitude on, on how, how to move forward and how to, how to carry myself. So Yeah, there was a span of time where like going, like you couldn't go out to eat and going to the grocery store was like going to a war zone. And so everyone was just like figuring out what they can do at home. It was just so funny. Like even yeah. that feels like a special, like a deeper part of this whole quarantine thing. But yeah. like, I wonder when will we get to like produce another art show? When can we attend another art show without having so many rules or at least having less restrictions? Like, when do you think that is? Art shows? I don't know. I mean, I think it's getting, it's like, it's really all the vaccine-ish type thoughts. But at the end of the day, it's opening up a little bit. I mean, if you can go to a restaurant, like in outdoor setting and like kind of deal with it that way, I think it's getting closer. But I mean, I'm a big safety first kind of person. Like, I'm not going to go to a restaurant for a while. You got a family too, though. Yeah. So like, uh, we, we would when before all this went down, like we would go to Japan all the time. And like, if they have, they've had a mask culture for like 200 years. Like That's it's so weird. true. A lot of Asian countries have had a mask culture. Yeah. So I, I really liked that. And even when I was coming back from the last time I was in Japan, which was January, um, I brought masks back with me. So <laughs> it, it, it's like one of those funny things that like, I think this coming into the setting, like, people are going to have to step into their role and understand that it's going to be like this for a while, especially art shows, venues, things like that. But even for me, like, so, I mean, I direct a mural festival, right? 
-hmm. And like, even for that, we're still planning on having the mural festival because we know, at least I know that even the same thing being in quarantine, I can keep artists on their walls by themselves, which but is that's outside though. That's predominantly outside. That's not like being in like a small venue where it's a hundred plus shoulder to shoulder. And that's kind of like the fun part of the art show is that it's so packed and there's so many people and there's right. energy going on. Well, I think of it as an outdoor gallery. So like if we can ah, put out, ooh. yeah, right. If we can that's put out like, you know, 20, 30 murals and it gives people a chance to do that. So they can social distance, they can go see some artwork and then they can enjoy it because the whole goal of, that is to beautify the community and you know I, I think that's a step towards the right direction of like giving people you know art and interested and you know being active in that way but also keeping them safe and that's what you do with your company powwow it's how yeah powwow dc so powwow dc is an international mural festival so basically i'm not gonna tout it but like we are the largest international mural festival Dude, in the you world. can flex man you, you can flex you gotta you gotta flex my audience let, let them know i'm <laughs> talking to a real one here <laughs> It's, it's, it started in Hawaii around 10 years ago. Um, and then we have sister festivals all throughout the world. So Japan, Rotterdam, Taipei, Long Beach, like Worcester, Massachusetts. Like, Holy shit. Yeah. That's bigger so, than I thought it was. I thought it was have, just like a DC thing. No, we have another one coming up in Cleveland. And like, even like, like again, uh, February, we went for the anniversary uh, in Hawaii and all the directors went and we all like, you know, we work together, we figure out how to make the, 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 our culture and our festivals better. And like, we really bond. And it was like one of those things. Cause it was like a lot of travel. It was like January, Japan, like February, like Hawaii and LA and all this other stuff. Then all of a sudden it was like, <clears throat> everything broke. Yeah. You can't but, even do anything, but that's probably like the most yeah. acceptable sort of art displaying we can do. And like the public can approach at this point in time where it's yeah. artists are outside, the public is outside. And yet it's still adding this, culture and ambiance to the city, which is something that I think everyone's kind of embracing more of now. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the whole goal for us is to beautify the community. It, it mm -hmm. is not a, it's not a, a money thing. It's a, like, it's a great the slogan. Way, yeah. It's the, the one thing that I realized being an artist is that, um, I'm trying to figure out a better way to say this, but it's selfish. It's a greatest job in the world, but in, in, if I want to paint like purple elephants for the rest of my life, I'm, that's like, that's what I'm going to do. And like, that's my career. And I'm like, all right, how do I paint it of like a shade of lavender? And like, all of a sudden it's another elephant. But at the end of the day, you're not shit without your community supporting you. Mm, it's true. You know what I'm saying? Like it, like art is definitely not a necessity. It's a luxury item in a sense. So when it turns around and people all of a sudden make you feel like a necessity and you are able to still sustain a living right now is amazing. And it's only because of my yeah. community. So yeah. the way I give back is like by doing the festival and trying to beautify the community as best as I can by bringing in like amazing talent, like from all over the world, not this time probably, but like gathering the community and, and helping them succeed and supporting them and showing them that, you know, we're here for them and that we can help like do everything we can and make it better. So. Well, I mean, that makes sense. Cause I feel like local art communities need more help than ever. And, and I think during yeah. this whole quarantine, we've all learned that we need artists to create because if we didn't, we'd be bored as shit sitting in our house. <laughs> and we can, we, yeah. you, we can speak freely as podcasts. We can curse whatever we want. But yeah, like, yeah. Um, uh, if, if there was no art, people would literally have nothing to do. We'd be twiddling our thumbs playing uh, like that, 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 what is that? Like that square game at Cracker Barrel where you're hopping pegs. Yes, that's a good game. Um, <laughs> Me and my grandmother always play that game. We always like, get competitive about that one. Yeah, I destroy my child on that. Anyways. <laughs> you um, have to. I feel like as a parent, you have to destroy your entire family or like, your kids in that game. I mean, you got to stand up for it. I mean, if you don't, like, you, you, you shame yourself at the end of the day. Have you, you had that moment where your son has, like, beat you in something? And you're like, oh, oh yeah. Shit. Yeah, oh, he's, man. He's, he's eight years old. And, like, there's funny things that he does that, like, completely catches me off guard. Like, and when they get bigger and start saying phrases and sayings that, like, all of a sudden, he, like, the other night, he was sitting on the stairs while we were hanging out. He just asked him a question. He goes, sweet. And I was like, oh, all right. Sweet. Like damn, sweet. bro. <laughs> sweet, sweet homie. Yeah, all right. And it was just like little simple things, but like, yeah, he's caught me off guard. Like, he's in the studio with me all the time. I hang out with him like all the time. Like, we hang out, we do stuff, and like, it's really, really fun because I actually even before this, before the quarantine and crisis, like, I would be with him like all the time before he went to school, like much more than any other parent because I had the, the better situation of working out of a studio work live spot. 
Dude, so, that's so cool. It, I'm so jealous. I wish my parents were artistic. Like that, that's like, that's so cool. It, it's always like the, the kids with the artistic parents become greater than their parents and become like this phenomenon, like, like, like Mozart or Bach or any of them. It's like their parents were really good, but then yeah. for some reason the kid, because they were brought up in that environment become this like phenom. Or he's going to be an orthodontist. <laughs> <laughs> becomes an accountant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I support it in every way, you know, whatever he wants to do right now, he's into paleontology. He like really loves dinosaurs. He's he, like massively, massively loves dinosaurs. And like, he's just like, I'm like, all right, that's cool. As far as I know, besides Jurassic Park, like paleontologists don't make money. They just like, it's I, not I don't really know what they do besides dust bones. Like that's all I yeah, think they do. I mean, try to discover new ones. So I'm like trying to push him to see if he wants to do like a YouTube paleontology kind of career oh, so that he can like move. channel it, be creative. Um, but yeah, like he, he's, his rad Atticus. You know, I wonder, really I good. wonder when there's, when's that moment where he realized he's like, Oh shit. He's like my dad. He's gonna be like, my dad's really cool. Like there's has that moment <laughs> happening where he like, he gets so old. He's like, wait a minute. He's like, my dad's actually not stupid. He's pretty dope. Mm, I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think our job, uh, I think when you become a parent, your job is to make your kid better than you. You know, I think mm. that that's what parents should strive for at least like that's what we try to start for so like if he at some point in time thinks i'm rad then i'll take it you know well, i feel so. like like naturally you guys would be in the studio together and i've seen i've been in mm. your studio once and you have mm. like this really sick like bunker all at the top of your studio that <laughs> i guess he chose in. but i imagine there's moments where like you teach him stuff and like you're painting and like you pass these sort of things down yeah so yeah he has a little loft in there the little loft is he's claimed it kind of for right now but like it's basically before it was for artists or friends of mine that would maybe be in town they want to crash out or or even during powwow like if there's so many people there and there's so much going on before uh, like people would just hang out and occasionally people would party and then pass out or whatever so like at the studio it's nice because like we can sleep like four or five people if needed but like it's not where we sleep ever um yeah, dude, your studio yeah, is sick. Your studio is super you. sick. Like, I uh, I went there last year for the open studios at, for the DC Art Center, or DC mm -hmm. Art Studios, open studios. And that was the first time I, I, I think I formally met you. It wasn't mm -hmm. the first time I ever met, I ever, like, had been exposed to your art. That's probably, like, the second time. The first time, dude, was uh, at the Umbrella Show, like, two oh, yeah. years ago. Dude, that yeah. was an insane show. And in my opinion, Thanks. one of the most, like... Your work was awesome, but as a collective, like that whole experience was probably one of the most inspiring but coolest things I've seen like happen in DC in a long time. Would you mind like for people listening explaining what that show exactly was like? Or so basically, um, there's a couple artists named No Kings Collective, Peter Chang, Brandon Hill. They're really really great guys, and they like that's one of the things that their avenues they work really well with is like finding spots like that and just yeah. throwing out bangers of of like experiences and things um obviously everything slowed down but I, as soon as it comes back together i know they'll they'll have a run of things but basically they had gotten in a relationship with an owner of a couple buildings and they proposed the idea and made it all work of having a massive show where they just utilized as much as the space they can which they did and bring artists in to just rock it out for what was it uh one week or something like that yeah, I think it was a week before the yeah. building got torn down. It was just like this crazy complex of art. Yeah, it was wild. It was like an old uh, school type deal, an old grocery store. I was in the old grocery store. Um, like, yeah, it's just one of those things where like the homies said, yeah, do you want to do a show? Because I was ready to do a solo. And I was like, yeah, I'll take the spot. And they're like, which one do you want? Like, where do you want? And I just like picked the old grocery store and I just basically gutted it in a sense and then murked it out and Dude, put it all was, up. That installation was sick. Uh, you probably yeah. had one of the better setups in that spot because you had like your own sort of private thing. And it was kind of, it kind of yeah. reminded me of like a dark subway in a sense. Like it was yeah. cool. Yeah, I, I liked it. Uh, I, I had to paint it all black and like get it to be the right setting because like most of the newer works were um, works on tile and like the white subway tile. So I wanted to have the really vibrant balance and like pop it off. But um, yeah, no, I really, really like that show. And like even from that show, I've gone in the in a similar direction of still working on the tile pieces and like um just popped off a new um a new one too where uh, i did uh 
Uh, shoot. Yeah, you, your tile work has been sick, and I can actually pull up photos of it. I have some screenshots I want to pull up because I have some questions. Oh, yeah. But like, dude, that umbrella, real quick. I can't believe AOC showed up to that shit. Like, <laughs> like yeah, I can't I believe know. the city actually recognized like an art show. Like that doesn't happen. The fact that she showed out, or that anyone of yeah. that sort of like notoriety showed out, it's like, oh yes, like they're noticing. Like they're taking note of like yeah. what's going on in the city, and the fact that we can have cool things that are, are like art minded. Because I I grew up in like the Northern Virginia area, kind of visiting DC. And I never, I feel like I never saw any murals. I never knew of any art shows, right. but like in the last few years that I've kind of been involved with it. And I'm, I know you've been involved like way longer, dude. Like, uh, yeah. I feel like I've seen this like crazy resurgence of murals, of art shows, of really interactive mm-hmm. experiences. Well, I think that like putting it down, like most New York, LA, San Francisco, like creative, creatives and stuff like that it's an industry you know they have mm-hmm. like fashion they have like movies they have like it really it's really embedded and it is an actual industry it's not an industry here you know so it's taken a while for us to actually establish uh, like uh, it's always had a culture of artists but like to establish something and make it a precedent to make it move forward and to really do that and like that's like part of my job that's part of your job and that's part of other people's job like peter and brandon and stuff like that like really pushing and doing it because there's a lot of people that can just you can just talk 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 i wish there was this i wish there was that well mm-hmm. and, like you can put up or shut up you know what yeah, i'm saying like real fast. talk like do do what you want to do if you want to do an event learn how to do an event if you want to do a show if you want to do an interactive installation just learn how to do it and do it that's the only way to make art or to make anything happen and I've, it's really come to a forefront where a lot more people are, are putting that on for, for the city. And I love it because people don't realize what a melting pot we are. Like, even what you said, like, there, there's, like, it's, it's starting to blossom and people like AOC come out or this and that. But, like, really, like, if you actually look at the culture of it, embassies, all the embassies from around the world, they actually do pockets of stuff. Mm-hmm. You'll see them do installations represent artists from their countries and stuff like that and it's just starting to pile more and more in so mm-hmm. like embassies are coming together and bringing it on people are starting to do more public works like even if like someone popped up on another mural festival i would encourage the hell out of that because well, it's like more, the, it's like the general acceptance of these ideas are yeah. being made like i don't know what that shift has been but just feels like in the city like general acceptance of like let's have let's en- use art to engage with the public and and sometimes i can't help but be pessimistic and think that it's it's like pull up politicians and some people like exploiting some artists in a way like look at us we're, we're putting a mural on our building we're so right. cool and into the culture but at the same time the artists win the artists got paid the culture still gets paid the community still gets that look so it's right. kind of like ah, we'll take it it's a double-edged sword like like there's, go, yeah. there's things where people are just like even for our mural festival they're like well you work with developers i'm like yeah because they own the buildings <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's 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 the only logical thing is that when you talk about working with your community there's more than just a selective group of people that are in your community there's a there's so many other people and like you're able to work with all of them it, I, I mean to try to benefit everyone you know mm-hmm. like there, there's no one scenario that works that makes one certain like artist group better than the other, you know, like if, if we can all get on a playing field, everyone should operate and help each other out on that playing field. And it, yeah. and it's just an interesting conversation because like, yeah. like in the beginning, like when I started doing graffiti in the city, when I was a young kid running wild, like I was totally like punk rock, like fuck everyone. And I was horrible at graffiti. It was like, like it, it's an straight ego game. bombing, just straight up it, tags. Like. Yeah, it, I was, I, I went out and did it, but I was horrible at it. And then I learned like, you know, to do my own shows and to figure myself out and become an artist. But I also figured out like you, you actually turning a back to people or, or things or conversations, like you can still say no to stuff, but mm-hmm. I'm saying like having open conversations and being realistic, like at the end of the day, it will get you further than just being like, you yeah, know? like 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 what you're saying. Taking that artist mentality, fuck the system, fuck the people. How dare you talk to developers? That's not right. how you win. That's not how we're all going to win, and we're all going to eat and build this sort of like art industry in DC. Because by right. talking with those developers, now you have the opportunity. Now your business grows. Like everyone gets it. The the, the local culture gets it, and it's like that's right. just a part of like establishing an actual legitimate art presence. But like yeah. also, it makes me think of the fact that DC has always had this rap of a transient city, right? And the transient Mm, city has this like lack of culture 
sort of ideas. Like I'm going to come and go because uh, there's not much culture here. There's sort of just like expensive apartment buildings and some touristy monuments. But when people like you who have been operating at DC for like, I don't know how long you've been. <laughs> it's been like, a long time, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, and you slowly build this culture in this thing that makes people want to stay and gives someone to look forward to. It's like all of a sudden that transient city starts to like slowly fade away because now yeah. it has something to call its own or it has something. Well, you nailed it. Like it's, it's really like, well also like the transient used to come with like the, uh, like who was in office, you know what mm. I'm saying? Like you'd have one or two so terms true. of, of, of like a Democrat and then all of a sudden he goes out and then, then there's a Republican and then it switches up. And like, that's what would happen is like people will come in for that, for that term and then into DC and then leave. But now, like, it, it, the biggest yeah. trend is, like, in the past 10, 12 years is that there's people who come into D.C. and then they realize, wow, this city is, like, actually cool. And then all of a sudden, like, our food scene just, like, went through the roof. Yeah. Dude, the food our scene, food scene is, like, went through the goddamn roof. Slept like, And there's so many people, like, getting, like, all of a sudden, like, accolades and Michelin and this and that and the other. Like, and then people just, like, yeah, they slept on us. They didn't, they didn't think, like, it was worth it. And then all of a sudden people stay because they're, like, amazing food. The culture's popping. There's things that are happening, and it's not, and it's exciting time. And it's like almost like a renaissance where it comes back in. We're just like we get smacked down by this whole uh, coronavirus. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change that the people that have come in, the people that I've, I've grown up with, started like breweries. They started like mm -hmm. amazing restaurants. They started all these other things, and they're not gone. You know what I'm saying? So how long have you been operating, or just like in DC, sort of? I I went to high school at uh, PG County. I went to Eleanor Roosevelt and. Oh, wow. I would always come to the city and like do stuff and hang out and whatever. And then I moved into the city uh, around, I want to say my sophomore year in college. I went to university of Maryland and just stayed and like forever loved it. So that was, I don't know, 2000. Wow. So, so you've seen this place really change, like from the inside point of view. Yeah. Like, but even before, like the convention center where it is now, there was the old convention center across the street from it. And that convention center was just like empty lots. And people used to dump bodies in those lots. Like, yeah, they, there's a wild like, place, man. Yeah, yeah, like popular little cool niche places like Blagden Alley. Blagden Alley was like, there was a really rad art space there, but like, it was the same thing. It was crazy. Like, you 930 did not want to walk over there. No, no, 930 Club, you would run to it. You wouldn't, you, you would park and run to it. Dude, I, I tell people that story. When I was in high school yeah. going to hardcore shows and shit, we yeah. would get off at the U Street Metro station and we would yeah. literally sprint to the 930 Club because it, 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 you just felt like you were in danger getting off of that Metro. Yeah, man. There's a ton, there's a ton of things that would, like, I could tell stories for days, but it's just like, yeah. it yeah. went from wild, wild west to like, all of a sudden there's things happening and then all of a sudden, like, there's more of everything. Like, there's restaurants, there's brew, like DC Brow, like first brewery in, in DC and like, I don't know how long and they're crushing it. Like yeah, really, really like doing amazing stuff. And then all of a sudden, like now there's like 15, 20 breweries, distilleries, like things like that. And like, we're only a population of 600,000. It, it, like, oh. It's really amazing for us to like really cultivate those things. And like, it's now, I love it because like there's a C and E fill and E kind of deal. Like mm. somebody comes in and like all of a sudden they're like, Oh, there's no Uzbek restaurants. I'm Uzbek. Like, let me pop it there, off. And then is, like, yeah, there's all of so much there's opportunity like, for just fill in these voids where you could sort of fit in. And that's why it's like, it's so easy to start something and be successful yeah. at it in the city, especially as an artist, because there's so much opportunity, but I'm so glad you brought up the food scene thing because yeah. that in my opinion is one of the things that's made DC into what it is, is the fact that you have all these nice restaurants opening and people perhaps staying in a neighborhood because there's a bunch of nice restaurants or whatever it yeah. might be. And then now they're all getting recognized. Like we just got our first three Michelin star restaurant, the little inn at Washington. Yeah. 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 That's it's, big it's wild. That's a big deal. It's very big because there's other cities that don't even have any. And it's like Michelin was like, it's not whatever Michelin's Michelin. But the yeah. thing is, is like they'll get business because of that. Mm -hmm. And like, good for them. Like good, like support your local shit. But like at the end of the day, it's like one of those things, like if it, if it becomes better for the city and like all of a sudden like you can't get into the restaurant or like it like who what's the um oh god they're over off of u street they also got michelin nod but they got something it was um they're african african off god. of you with a michelin nod uh they're tucked in the back alley they have the giant open fire pit in their in the restaurant. oh 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 my god oh my god i feel like i should know this because it's brought up a lot Oh yeah. my God. fuck. Yeah. They're, uh, they're destroyed before you can get in there. Like now, like now, obviously not now, now but like, yeah, 
but you know, like before, like like January, December, we were thinking about going. No, nah, they were booked out. Or like, or like Bad there's... Saint, like like Bad Saint, that little hole in the wall. You, you, I've literally gotten there at at seven o'clock when they open, and yeah. they don't they don't even take reservations. I've got there at seven. I was the third person in line, and we still had to wait an hour to get it. Yeah, in. I've never even eaten there. That's how like, <laughs> like that's how busy they are. Like it's just ridiculously upsetting to me because there's so many killer restaurants, like so many great spots, and like it's just one of those things. It's like we're like restaurants chefs they're, they're creatives in their own right you know they're, and they are, that's yeah. an amazing thing to like have as your culture because like that's a necessity like people love to eat like that's one of those things like when instagram came along it's like people watching people eat or youtube or whatever like it's one of those things you're just like oh that's amazing like a little person ate like 50 million pounds of ramen da, 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 that's phenomenal that, that's called a mukbang yeah, yeah. That's it. Wild, yeah, you, that stuff is crazy. I've shown people who don't know about it, and they just freak out when I show them like a spicy seafood mukbang, and it's kind of disgusting. But yeah. you see this dude just talking and stuffing literally like twenty pounds of seafood in his mouth, and you're just like, oh. it's so oh. rad. <laughs> or the or the ASMR stuff. Have you seen the ASMR mukbang where it's like, have you seen that one? Uh -huh. Where they don't talk, but. With ASMR, what you do is you turn the gain on your microphone up really high, and then you put you wear headphones. That makes the experience better, and you oh. hear every little like movement and crackle. And, oh like, my God. And, and then and then and then when they eat the food, like you hear the like nah, like dude, it's 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 like it's so uncomfortable. It's also like a weird sort yeah. of like that was. And they satisfying. get millions, millions of views. Millions of views. Millions of views, dude. Millions of views. It's crazy. Yeah, but it's just like one of those things. It's like I, I love that aspect of where it like food has turned into an art form, like literally, and it's taken over a ton of different things. And it's just like really wild because like you find those those things. And even in my work, like I'll, I'll channel a lot of food stuff. Like it's because I'm hungry at the studio. I'll just be like, God damn it, I'm hungry. And then all of a sudden, like I made a ramen thing and i'm just like i've yeah, noticed that probably. some of your sculpture it's like a ramen bowl or like a, a oh. like a bento box with something yeah it's or just a, i mean like it's just like one of those things where you just like really like people it's like like i said it's a necessity people love food people love you know clothes people love like houses or whatever like, like yeah, this yeah, right yeah. here yeah, yeah yeah dude i love that dude that is so sick yeah the ramen jordans dude, yeah that's it, th that one actually like there's a couple sculptures I have that took a while to like do because like I would have to I mean I would I got them made in Japan and like it, I would go I was going back and forth for a couple years trying to figure out how to get these translated and like well, you, you to, had to get this made in Japan yeah yeah I, because the only way I was gonna do it was do it right so like it's it's like fake food and like basically I had to work with the people that that make fake food. And I had to like Japanese culture and to do business with them is like kind of difficult because like you have to really like, there can be a loss in translation, um, the truest form. So I had to go a couple of times and then figure out where they were kind of located and then make an introduction and then come back again and see their factory and how they do their process. And then I had to figure out how to translate what I want to do and give it to them. Because when they ask for something, like if you wanted a fake food dish, say a restaurant, wants fake food they yeah. actually have to make the food itself and give it to the people give it to the, the 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 producers of the fake food and then they reproduce it they, so if say it's like a fried fish they'll bring them the whole fried fish dish they'll take the fish they'll make a mold of it and then actually make it look a, a million times better than the restaurant actually brought so, so you're telling me that you had actual jordans made out of noodles like in this photo right here Yes, I had to. I had to completely do like I had to make this whole what? thing and then give give it to them. And when we sat down at the meeting, the first time I talked to them, I was like, I was like, all right, I want to do this. And they're like, well, we don't understand. I was like, look, when you guys make this stuff, how you make it? And they're like, okay. I was like, do you have a mold of an apple? They're like, yes. And I was like, all right, dope. I want to do a ramen apple. And they're like, brains started leaking out of their head. They're like, they're like, we don't. I don't get it. And I was like, take full the mold of the apple and let's put ramen stuff in it. They're like, yes. And I was like, sweet, understood. All right, cool. And then I had to like reverse engineer how they were doing it too. So I had to make it to give to them so that they can make it. So it was like really, really wild because like as an artist, nine times of the time, like I'm very impulsive. I like to just like make and like get dirty and gritty and whatever. So I really like, this was a really big endeavor of like going there, investigating, finding out, like seeing their process, reverse engineer it and then come back to them and have them produce it. 
But you so, went to them. You went to them because traditionally, Japan makes the best toys. Like their their toy manufacturing is like the best. Their their replicas yeah. and their three D models. It's 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 the shit. It's the shit. Yeah, they've been. This company's been around for a hundred years. They've been making fake food for a hundred years. So like, oh. it, it's like one of those things. that's like I could try to engineer and do it myself, but what like it would take me like a hundred years to figure out how to make it like they can. So like, basically I just like, all right, I'm just going to go to you and figure it out. And it's been an amazing process because it's led to more and more. And like, every time I go, like I would all of a sudden go on, like a homie would hit me up and be like, Hey, do you want to paint a wall? I'm like, yeah. Hey, do you want to do so, this? And like, so fun. Yeah. It, and it's amazing because like I've gotten to be able to work with friends and work with people, but then it leads to relationships where I'm actually getting work and doing work while going to get stuff made. So all of a sudden like, I'm there and I'm like, Hey, like, hit up my friend and he's like one of the big creatives for apple in japan and we're sitting there talking about it and I actually showed him like the the ramen jordans at lunch one day and he's like yo this is amazing i'm like thank you i was like i, I remember i was telling you about coming back the next time when i was getting made and this is what they turned out to be and he's like do you want to go meet with nike and i was like what i was like yeah he's like <laughs> who just cool. throws that out there you just want to go meet with nike show him yeah. your ramen jays yeah yeah pretty much so he like literally after lunch he hopped on the phone and he tried to call his homie up and he was like He's like, oh, he's not picking up. He's probably in a meeting. Let me connect you email. And we were leaving like the next day, like my wife and son always come with me. And he hits me up. The guy hits me up like not more than an hour later. He's like, hey, what, you want to meet? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like uh, we're leaving tomorrow. He's like, when's your flight? And I was like, late, late in the evening. He's like, cool. Why don't you come meet? We'll go. And so we went. I was like, can I bring my family? Because like, you know, it's kind of a deal. And they're like, yeah, of course. So we came and like, it was dope. We went to the Nike headquarters in Japan and Tokyo and like what? they gave us a tour and we sat down and I talked to them for a little bit and pitched a couple of ideas. They're like, yo, we're really into this. And they want to talk the next time I'm there about doing a collaboration on a couple of things. Um, but it was like one of those experiences that like you have to really put yourself out there and like, mm. just like throw everything in the wind and things can manifest. And it's really wild because like you think you're going and doing one thing for one thing. You're like, I'm going to go make work and Tokyo. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it turns into like, I had a couple meetings and it's just like, I truly believe in the manifestation of positivity. Mm -hmm. Like if you be positive and you just put yourself out there and you just do the best that you can do as a human or as your job or whatever, it will, it will bring something around. Dude, I couldn't agree more, man. I like, it's, it's the idea that you went there just trying to get this awesome food inspired toy made yeah. but along that journey. Like it's all coming from a good place it's like you, you just naturally attract other people in like the same mindset, same opportunity, like same positive yeah. mentality. And boom, here you are at the Nike headquarters with your family. Dude, that's some wild shit. <laughs> yeah. So like, what's funny is like, like the tile pieces is led to other stuff. So like, there's this one that I just made. Oh, here, here, here. I'll pull it up. Right, I'll pull it up. I'll pull it up. So uh, like, it's, it's funny because I did the food one and then now I did the tile one. And it's just like, yeah, it, it's, okay. You really just got to put yourself out there and manifest and like, this one right yeah, here. Here. yeah. <laughs> Dude, that thing is so sick, man. Like it, it's so much fun to make. How like, did you honestly, do this, man? How did you, it's literally a Nike underneath of it. Everyone's like, what form did you use? Or how did you build the wood? I was like, no, I just actually took a regular shoe and then she started <laughs> like, <laughs> like making. Oh, so, so you literally just like, ca oh yeah. So yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Saying? But that's led into the conversation of me figuring out, okay, I could actually use a form and make it smoother and easier and better. But so like, you, you like, you took literally the Nike shoe and you put, I guess the ceramics, yeah. like you, and then you just stuck it onto there. Yeah. So I've got to en engrave the ceramics first, like bit by bit. So I had to like figure out like the shape of the sign, the, f the shape of the sole and all this other stuff and then engrave it and dye it and then adhere it. So like this one's a learning curve on this one. I think they're just going to get better and more fun. I'm like trying to figure out like, you know, what how to make it smoother and like how was to, this the idea that you showed to nike like you were like i want to make a ceramic shoe no this was this was manifestation of of covid this is like figuring out being like i literally did a whole series of just like throwing paint on clothes and like having fun with it like the first march or april and like did like kind of a series out of it and it wasn't anything besides like just me experimenting and then all of a sudden like the tile pieces let in and then all of a sudden like i started doing shapes from the tile pieces so like oh, doing a, a homer simpson or doing something else and then all of a sudden like this led into it and like now it's like the floodgates have opened so it's like i i don't even know like i keep spinning around the studio being like all right what's next what's next what's next and it's amazing because like i said like yeah so there's the the side profile of how to like figuring out how it was going to sit there and, and look and base and then 
start putting it on. Well, I love the references here. You have the, the Washington Nationals, the Pikachu, yeah. the Doremumu. I, I forget the name. It's like the Lazy Egg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, it, it's, it's funny because like, there's a lot of things that like, culture wise, or this, it, most of it's experiences or stuff that like, happen or come from because like especially like the shinjuku station like shinjuku like really references to me like when you come into japan when you come into tokyo a lot of times like it doesn't matter really if you're coming from narita airport like Mm -hmm. you come into shinjuku station and that's kind of like your your first experience and stop start with tokyo and it's like subway stations which is like one of the biggest in the world and it's like an entry way it's like a gateway and it's like really referenced to me and like you know Pikachu and like stuff like that. My son loves Pokemon, and like even at the studio, like we have 3D printers. So like, when interacting with him, like I'll be like, "Yeah, what Pokemon do you want?" And we'll 3D print him a Pokemon, and then he paints it and finishes it and stuff like that. So it's like figuring out how to how how these experiences, life, and like everything like that. I really put it all into my work and try to like channel it so it looks like a mash of weird cultural pop like stuff, but a lot of it is just like memory or like experience or anything like that that's gone and i've just like basically laid it out so Mm. like i love this new direction of being able to like spill these thoughts into these engravings and then all of a sudden turn it into something that's actually three-dimensional what makes you want to use the 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 ceramic tiles for for like the 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 base of everything i don't know like i i think in the beginning like i i wanted to emulate like the first piece I did with it, I wanted to emulate like this dive bar bathroom slash subway slash whatever, and just like really graffiti it and have fun with it because like those were places I had been and and to and like kind of gravitated towards. But also like there's usually graffiti and like a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, so like all like the graffiti and the tags and then actually inserting my work into it, it just made sense to me to to have this as a translation. So when I did it. The first one, like, it was the same thing. It's like, oh, floodgates have opened, like, I, and just, like, did a whole series. And, like, the new series that I'm doing, like, it's it's kind of part down a little bit more also from doing the graffiti and everything like that to just doing it, um, the engravings. And the engravings have now taken on the life of a, its own and turning them into characters or people or things. But it's also really rad because it's turned from these common – these notions of like dive bars or subways or this and that into like, um, I want to say like porcelain, you know, the old French porcelain ah, things and turning them into yeah. objects. I totally but, get what you're saying. Cause like these two that are on the screen right now, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw these at your umbrella show and these, yeah. I, these are in the wall of your studio in this, this, this actual screenshot is from a video. When I went to your studio, I made like a yeah. YouTube video, but yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, like this wall, the left with the ramen, it, it literally looks like the wall, of like a bathroom or like a subway station. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. the girl on the side, the, and then even just like the graffiti, it literally is like, you took that chunk of wall and just, like, yeah, like, just transplant. It's so sick. The, yeah. The first one I did, like it literally said Shinjuku station and stuff like that. And like, when I was hinting at it, people were like, how the hell, did you get into the station and do that? And then all of a sudden, like I showed the picture of the entire piece. People were like, how the hell did you rip that out of the wall? And I love (laughs) the process of it because it's like literally just taking the entire thing and like piecing it together and like doing that. But like, even like on the other pieces, like you'll see like tiles are mismatched and like not correct. And it's the same thing at like almost every subway station around the world. You'll have broken tiles in one section of the thing. We'll just replace it with other misshapen odd tiles. And then it just like, it has that ambience of like, it's, it's cohesive, but it's not, it's weird. But yeah, it's the same thing where it's like putting these shoes together. It's like patches of, uh, of, you know, different type of stuff. And then all of a sudden other things come into it. And like, it's just really, I, I'm having so much fun with it. And that's the, I think the greatest aspiration you can want to do as an artist. It's like sales are cool. Yeah. Sales, you make a living understood, but like really loving what you're doing and like what you're making and being inspired. Like it's always, the, I have that uh, question every once in a while. It's like, what's your favorite piece? It's like always the newest one. It's always the newest piece, yeah. the newest project, the newest mural. It's always that one. Cause it, I'm excited. Like it, mm-hmm. I'm just really, really excited to work. And that's right. It's just like really, I think that's what you should do. And I also get the other question, like I get a lot of artists to ask me, like, I don't know where to start. And that's a hard thing. Like I think yeah. for some artists where they, they can't figure out like something to do or base on it. It's the same thing with me. Like I have the same thing. Like, I'll, I'll sit in the studio and like, 
be like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, like, you just start playing with something, you make something, and then it turns into one thing. And I've always found that turning that one thing into a series is one of the best releases ever because then you get to explore and explore and then it falls into something else. And then it falls Dude, into I couldn't something. agree more. A lot of artists get stuck with this analysis paralysis where they're like, I need to come up with something great. It has to be this grand ambition. And like, they, they, they psych themselves out and stop them from even just rejotting that idea down or just looking at that tile or something. And then because it's like this pressure to create something bigger, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be the smallest thing. And that smallest thing is what turns into that series. Like literally with myself, uh, last year I did an exhibition uh, about the Cheshire and the whole exhibition stemmed from this one photo idea of this guy like blowing his brains out. But instead of like that visceral thing, it was like, you know, the opposite of like these rainbows and like the yeah. colors coming out. Yeah, yada, yada. But that one idea turned into an entire exhibition piece. And yeah. it, it, if I would have just held myself back from that one thing, I wouldn't have gotten to those other spaces. Yeah. It's so, like some of the most beautiful stuff is usually like the sketch like the sketch or the, the, the initial scratchings, the starts of it. And then it's it, like, it goes and like, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like some people try to go really grand and big and like, good, go grand, go big. But like, yeah. unless you, unless you, you have to start somewhere, you know, mm. like it's always the start. Like I guarantee like the first thing, like Christo wrapped was like not big. Like it was probably something. What was the first was ceramic cool. piece you did? Like what was the first time you like started with that medium? I think the first one I did was like, it was a, it was literally trying to translate the toy, the, the bathroom. So like I had like, it was at the umbrella show. It was the graffiti on the wall, but it had, had the toilet uh, roll. It had a toilet, like how you, the paper toilet paper roll, mm -hmm. but I 3d printed it. So that it was a little 3d printed toilet paper character, but it was an actual, you know, the attachment that goes into the wall and everything that I drilled into the actual piece. So that was Whoa. the first piece. Cause I just wanted to like make like a, a dirty bathroom kind of thing. I thought it was like amazing and like, it, yeah, it's old. It was like great, but like, it was funny because it was like, like just the idea of it. And it was hilarious is that I had like two friends of mine from Paris, um, Rever and Astro, and they tagged on the piece as well. So it's like, like I can have friends come in and like even collaborate. And, and it looks like it's a part of the piece. It's kind of sick. It's yeah. like, oh, and then, yeah, yeah most there. people wouldn't even, yeah, they wouldn't know. So it, it's just like, if, if you're in the culture, then you would understand the reference. But like, if you don't, then you don't realize that someone else has already gotten on there as well. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's really interesting to see that. And like, it's cool to know that that umbrella show, which is like, it's like two years now at, at yeah. one point, uh, pre-COVID art shows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like it, it's really cool to see how like that, those initial ideas evolves into some of the work that you're doing now. And yeah. I'll, pull, I'll pull one up and like, that's why I think it's so cool here. I'll pull this one up um, just so people can see. And it's, it's that ma those mask faces you did. Yeah. 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 I'm really into those right now. Dude, those are so sick, man. Like this right here. Oh my God. Yeah. I love them. It, and it's funny because like, even, even on these, it's like, there's so many references for me and it's just like the ideas of like where it says Yoyogi park. It's one of the parks in Tokyo and it's just amazing. But then like that pulled in my head, Yogi bear, like, so just pulling in that reference and then like, it's just hilarious. Like, is that Deadpool snake, in the middle? Yep. Snake eyes, snake eyes, bro. Snake oh, that's, eyes. oh, that's snake eyes from GI Joe. Yeah. Like little kid, like he used to be one of my favorite characters, like him and storm shadow. Like it was, it's like one of those things that like now it's like iconic, like old, like reference, like work type stuff. And I just love like those type of things because it, when I grew up, like I, um, I was born in the US, but I lived most of my childhood in Australia. And it was like the dead center of Australia, a little town called Alice Springs. So I lived there like most of my elementary school. Oh, wow. And like all we got, like this was pre everything. Like, so only channel we got was BBC One. And like during BBC One, like the, all we got was like Japanese anime that was dubbed. So like Astro Boy, uh, Voltron, things like that. So those were my childhood influences. And then, like, I would get GI Joes like sent over from my grandfather, or this and that, and the other. But it was like that. I know exactly where my influences came from. Like, it was from like those, like my childhood of like Japanese dubbed anime, like this and that, and the other. But then, like, got into like you know, middle school, come back to the U.S. and then like going to junior high, and it was like, oh, I got into metal, and then all of a sudden I got into like hardcore, and then raids, and all this other stuff. And then it just translated more and more and more, and I know exactly what my reference was. And it's kind of like 
great because like some people like have that weird thing where they can't they can't like put a a finger on it. Mm-hmm. You know, I know exactly where it comes from. Like like if people don't see my work sometimes they they'll think like I'm a like a twenty year old Japanese girl. I, don't know, but, like, I can see that. I mean even with the name Kelly, like I still get like, but it's fine. Like it's it's hilarious. Um, it's, it's interesting that like our childhood influences stick with us for so long. Like you yeah. have these other memories of like after school anime shows like i have those same sort of experiences but instead of like that was your generation but for me it was it was uh like uh, ronin warriors and like dragon ball and like gundam and stuff like that i still watch anime all the time i do too i love that shit yeah there's nothing but like the thing is my wife will be like stop watching cartoon i turn around i'm like they're animated stories (laughs) well no but there's there's the artistic value of it like how you create one of those things like i mean like it's really really time consuming to make an anime like it's mm-hmm. it's entirely crazy like to have people that do mangas and things like that like you have to be a really good artist to actually come out with that stuff and like and then tell a story on top of that yeah and then have the storyline and all of a sudden they get produced and the music and everything like that and the sound people and like it's it's intense man it's really, really wild. Well, dude, anime is one of those wild things where if, you, if you're if you into it and you get it, you really respect it. But if you don't, you're just like fucking nerds because it's it's <laughs> like, like it's, it's, that's what it is. Like, oh, watch over here cartoons, freaking nerds of people like like yelling and stuff. But you don't realize that it's like American people specifically have this bad rap on it because yeah. they're thinking of like Looney Tunes and they're thinking of like SpongeBob. Like, oh, I'm a grown up. I don't want to watch that. But yeah. they don't realize that like these animes – like there's they're actually filled with depth and knowledge and like lessons yeah. and really inspiring sort of motives and in, in characters dude the murder scenes god they're so intense right like, like there's but there's it's funny because the translation of what anime and how it influenced everybody else but then all of a sudden you have these shows where someone comes out and be like naruto that's stupid and then all of a sudden like it's like rick and morty that's genius and you're like oh because it it plays your instincts of being drunk and like doing whatever and like partying like like rick does and then all of a sudden it translates to someone else being like this is genius and like that's a like it's a south park like simpsons type influence mm. where it goes from that like degrading the culture of like you understand all this stuff and like it's just ridiculous to like making it entertaining and then like playing on the entire of like culture of it and it's like amazing like even how south park has been so long is that so still around years. is south park still operating i believe so yeah they must be Stony having. Seasons. They must be running away with concepts and things to narrate on these days. I mean, think about the Simpsons though. Simpsons are still on, right? I think so. Have they not gotten canceled yet? I'm surprised all that hasn't gotten canceled yet. I, I don't think so because, like, literally, they'll they'll come out with like, oh, um, the person that was voicing Apu is not going to do it anymore because he's not he's not of Indian descent. Oh, so, dude, like, that's so we, weird to me. That's so weird to me. That's a little too far I, for me. I, I'm 50 50 on it. Like, I think you have to like, you have to respect culture and people and things of that nature, but also in the same sense, like it's, it's animated. So like, no one's going to ever know, but like, I mean, should you not do Japanese references? Cause you're not Japanese. Truth. I understand that. But like, for me, it's like, if I was doing work that was replicating something else, I still wouldn't care because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I'm an artist. Like my job is to make and what I believe in like spitting out memories, ideas, like emotions. And that's my job. Mm-hmm. Like, so telling an artist not to do something is, is a little bit like offensive and odd. Or putting but, limitations on it or putting boundaries on what they can and can express. Right. But I think also in the same sense, like you have to be responsible for being sensitive to other people in a sense like mm-hmm. i always try to make my work positive mm-hmm. like I, I i don't like i don't do shock value i think that's, that's where people i think that's where people draw the line and like that's where the offense comes in is mm-hmm. where someone shits in a box and they're like hey it's art and they're like um, yeah i mean you're not like box. commentating on like japanese social issues you know it's like you're, it's like it's like taking the inspiration mm-hmm. of it and and using that for something else it's 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 finding inspiration yeah. that it'd be like saying an American chef can't ever cook ramen or, or like a, or, or an Asian guy can't fry chicken. It's, it's like, right. it's along those lines of what's, well, it's just inspiration and that's just how the world works. Right. I think, yeah, I think everybody borrows from everybody all the time. Mm-hmm. Like it's one of those things. And like people say like when there's artists that come out and they emulate another artist and it's just like really close to their work, you're just like, Hey, 
you know, it's really close. But like, I think that's one of the jobs as an artist is like, you sit there and figure out, well, maybe it is too close. Like, what should I do to make myself stand out and be better? instead of like having it look so similar or what can I do that like sits there and works and uses a positive imagery imagery and like makes something out of nothing. Yeah, I, I think it's the shock value that, that really sets people off when somebody tries to get clout just by being, you know, shocky or just by saying something or just by doing something intentionally. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, if, if the intentional value in there makes, makes it malice. I yeah, think it, that's where it really brings it into. I think if you you're trying to do better, be a better artist, be a better person. I think it's not hard. It's not hard as a human not to be an asshole. It's really yeah. not. I mean, man, and this is a tough topic to talk about. So if you don't want to comment on it, it's fine. But like, I see a lot of that stuff with the, a lot of the political stuff these days. Like, it's so easy to be a political artist these days, and right. and and without even being specific, like just in America, like if you do anything that's political and towards whatever movement you're automatically granted like clout or you're automatically considered gifted but it's like what and some people are using it for for the bat for the wrong reasons and they, they were they really even weren't a political commentator before that but then it's like well you're allowed to commentate whenever you want who am i right. to say that you can't just start commentating on the biggest issues right now in society yeah i think it's that's what i really firmly believe is in personal belief i think mm-hmm. you're allowed to personally believe something but for you to tell someone else they're wrong or bully someone is a mm-hmm. really, really bad thing. I think like it's a huge culture right now of people bullying other people when they're like, I'm an expert or I believe something or whatever instantly. And then bully someone about it. Like my son got bullied in school like the past year. And like me and my wife really struggled with uh, how to make it better, how to uplift him out to show him that he doesn't have to have this issue problem because it's a serious thing. And it's the same thing I think about politics. Like if you want to talk politics, you should try to do it more personally. And that's by that. I mean, like I don't talk politics on my social media. I don't talk oh, politics on like this and that do. because I believe if someone wants to know my personal political belief, I can have a conversation with them when I'm one. And it, it's more intelligent, logical, and easier to sit there and say, this is what I believe cool and then someone else says well this is what i believe i'm like cool i can see your your mindset that's fine but, but like so many people, people can't do that and, and i'm so uh, glad that hasn't penetrated into art where someone's like trying to cancel someone because of their art opinions or because they drew something like controversial or whatever but we literally especially in dc where we're, we're in a situation where if you don't agree with someone one person is normally going to be more enraged and automatically like label and start criticizing yeah. and start la- in and acting in a very hateful manner just because they don't agree with them regardless yeah. of of what it is that's i don't think that's a, a right way to have civil discourse and to discuss ideas uh, yeah it, and it turns into one of those things where it's like a lot of people just try to nitpick through your life and say this you're wrong for this you're wrong for that blah 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 blah, blah. and i'm just like that's you know i i can understand that people can get upset and emotional about something mm-hmm. but to try to take people down just over the smallest things is like absurd like someone makes a comment on some board and then all of a sudden like 10 people attack them and the like the comic could be like about butter and like yeah. like if it's better to be unsalted or salted and you're just like like people just need to like and that's where i think a lot of this quarantine came back into play where you know people really isolated themselves and they just like festered and like can only release online or this and that because mm. they can't do it amongst other people and a lot of things like built up in people personally and i think it's it's also amazing that we're seeing this time of where you know the the thing of you know really forcing to the head of black lives matter of like people are all people are valuable but it's like we're really focusing on saying hey black lives matter like you really need to take a step back and understand like what you've done in your life how you've affected people this and that but you could do it positively Mm-hmm. You know, you can sit there and put a, a, a step forward of being like, well, how can I help? How mm-hmm. can I do something? And a lot of that, like, I like doing that through my art. And I like trying to channel that and being a better person and self-improving. Because I can't change anyone. I can only change myself. Even my son. He wants to be a paleontologist. I can only encourage him and be supportive. Yeah. You know, even for my friends, they want to do something. I can only sit there and say, hey, you can do it. Like, I believe in you. Like, I can try to support you. But at the end of the day, like, you, you can only change yourself. You can't change other people. And like going off and ridiculing people and bullying them, it's not changing. 
it makes it, it worse. It makes it yeah. worse. If you, if you blow up and try to excommunicate someone from something, or even if it was something they said five years ago, let alone like a year ago, I'm, I'm a different person than I was a year ago. You know, it's like, don't hold yeah. me to whatever I said. The climate was different. The, everything was different. Yeah. And it, I, I just, I just hate to see it. And I hate to see people not being able to like, like you said, like, like talk and, 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 and have this sort of conversation about things yeah. and, artists not feel they feel uncomfortable to do something or, or doing this or I don't know it's it's just such people a, people are imperfect people make yeah. mistakes but you learn from mistakes like mm-hmm. that's the only way you, you improve your life and become a better person is you realize oh man I shouldn't have had road rage or something like that because people like people with road rage is kind of amazing it's because they set off at the most like simplest thing and like losing it and I, I remember when I was younger I used to be a dickhead like and like go off and like get upset about stuff like that but now like when I'm driving and like someone has road rage and they yell at you they start yelling and you just like you ask a simple question you're like why are you yelling like why are you yelling you can tell me anything you want to tell me in any conversation whether it's road rage or not be like why are you yelling you're embarrassing yourself please don't yeah, don't like, let what's your emotions what's... get a hold of you yeah, just have like... a conversation it's like the light just turned green and I didn't move in point one seconds. Calm down, dude. You don't got to give me the honk. <laughs> I yeah. hate that. I it's hate just that. Like, <laughs> but it's just like, like yeah. the thing is, you're not going to change that person, but you, you can try to de-escalate a situation and try mm. to get someone to actually be rational and be like, it's not worth it. It's not worth your time. We have such little time on this earth. Like, it's really true. And like, the better off that we can treat each other, the better we are. And the better we improve ourselves is like, at the end of the day, I think our main goal. Like, you should just like, People don't, some people believe in karma, some people don't, but I think being a good person, putting good things out of the world and trying to be actually positive and beneficial helps, you know? Yeah, like and I think, anything I think you made a good point about the fact that we're all in quarantine. We all have less to do. We're not worried about where we're going to go get brunch on Sunday because you literally can't. Like, and so <laughs> we're, we're over here stewing over ideas and running circles in our mind. Right. And there's some people who are literally like, alone in their, in their, in their apartments with, yeah. and like, they can't meet up with their friends and like, I remember the first day I moved into this this place, the girl below me, I was like moving shit like at 11 o'clock at night. So I'm trying to like build my bed, right? Uh-huh. She comes upstairs and she knocks on her. She's like, she was like on the, br- on like the verge of like a mental break. She, like, snap. she was like, I haven't seen my friends in months. I haven't seen anyone. I've been here. I'm, I'm, she's like, I'm going home tomorrow for, for a few months. I won't be below you. If just this one night, if you could just be quiet. And I looked at her and I was just like, I was like really baked. I was just like, oh my God, what is this that you're doing to me? And I was just like, you know what? I was just like, all right, all right, you got it. I don't want to get like stabbed tonight. And, and, then, and then it went, but, but there's so many people like that. And then that can be like translated into yeah. some, what someone said or what they think or not yeah. agreeing with them. But like, luckily, you know, not everyone's like us where they have an art, they have an outlet where they always have something to do, something to channel it into. What, what, I mean, when was the last time you actually talked to your neighbors? You know what I'm saying? Like most people don't even talk to their goddamn neighbors. Like I like, it's one of those things. Like if you actually have a friendly conversation with someone and you build a, a mild, like simple, mild relationship, all of a sudden those issues, they, they, they break down to nothing. And they're just like, Oh, Ted's fine. He's all right. He's a good guy. He doesn't mean to be loud right now. He'll be all right. And like, it turns into that. Like it turns into those conversations that I think you engage and interact with people. I mean, you got to be really, really malice to want to like, you know, well, it's like weird really because we're kind up. of, it's weird because we're kind of in this situation where people value community more than ever, but people distrust yeah. each other individually more than ever because we all think the other person has Corona. Like, <laughs> like, like, yeah. like I step out my door and I look to my apartment and to the right, if, if like, I don't have my mask or she doesn't have her mask on there, even like we all we just go <gasps> cover our face yeah. or something. And it's like this weird sort of like, I don't trust you feeling that doesn't feel right. right. I don't like that yeah. at all. Well, the, I mean, what yesterday they just did the mandate dc mask. oh the yeah, mandatory like, mask mandatory it's mandated now you have to wear a mask outside it doesn't matter that's why you get up to a thousand dollar fine people are like what are you gonna do you're gonna get a fine for a thousand dollars that's <laughs> real you can get a fine now like literally something could roll up to me like yo here's a thousand dollar fine cop can roll up to you say why aren't you wearing a mask you, you say fuck you i don't want to you say all right cool here's a thousand dollar fine you, cool. you can have your opinion <laughs> i mean like i think you know what i think is is crazy is that it's 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 the, one of the things that I started making actually, as soon as it happened, I realized like it's going to turn into a mass culture. Like mm-hmm. we're, we're going to basically go, go the way of Japan, whether people are fighting it now or not, it doesn't change the fact that probably in Japan around 200 years ago during their Edo period, like they were, it was coal mining and that's why they started wearing masks and people really? were getting sick. Yeah. It was coal mining. So like what happened was, is like they translated now. And like, even now it's like, if you feel sick before Corona, you would wear a mask or if you don't, 
like if like this is not me saying it is it's just one of those the cultural things if a girl didn't feel like wearing makeup she would wear a mask or this and that and the other it was just like a face covering and it's turned into an accessory then and it's a very accepted and like I, it's gonna change here too like even after if coronavirus gets a vaccine even after it's still going to be a mask culture people are going to wear masks because they're like you said untrusting but the thing is at the end of the day you're going to be healthy you know what mm. i'm saying this is just my own personal belief is that looking at their culture and being there and seeing how they wear masks even just if you feel sick if you feel like you have the flu or a cold or whatever you don't want to give it to someone else it's the same thing with what everything's going on right now or you don't want to get it then you just wear a mask because they, they have one of the biggest subway systems in the world in Tokyo. And it's just like very common that there's a lot of things going on. That's so, interesting. Like, I, I remember growing up and looking at photos of like China and Japan and seeing them wear masks. And I always thought it was mm. so weird. And I assumed like in places like China, it was because of like the pollution and whatnot. But I didn't, yeah. I never thought it was for the reasons of someone actually not wanting to get other people sick or, or like thinking they just looked ugly because they weren't wearing makeup. It's, it's fascinating. It's, no, it, yeah, it's the truth. It's, it's really, it's really thought provoking because if they can do it for 200 years and like the U S is only now we're forced to do it. But like at the end of the day, they've turned it into like, it's basically an accessory also. Like yeah. you can get something that looks really, really dope. And where is that? Like, you know, like people that brought ninjas into this world, I think they're onto something like, you know, Mask face are here to cool. stay. Mask, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just like, it's now it's just a part of our like, like you wear underwear, you wear socks, and you might yeah. wear a mask if you want to, except now you have to wear a mask or else you're going to have to pay your rent in, in fines. I mean, it's, it's just a piece of cloth on your face. It's not that big of a deal. I think yeah. it personally, but I think if you're, if it's going to go anything, like turn it into an accessory, like fact that like people wear hats because the sun's out too bright, like things like that. Like it, you, you can, you can definitely find something that you would find acceptable as a mask and wear it. Like, but I think it's, it's here to, it's here to stay for a while. Like, I even mean, if there is a vaccine, it's going to be around for a while. But that, I think, is the one of the greatest outlets, too, is creatives and artists. How many artists jumped on masks and doing them and, like, pr producing, like, it is cool. Yeah, no, it, it became yeah. an income in a time that's rough. And then also, it's like, you don't look stupid wearing a doctor's mask. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as soon as this happened, like, I jumped on masks, like, immediately. Because, A, I thought they were cool. But, like, B, like, I just knew that there would be a need for it. And it was really, really true. So, I mean, if... if People wearing masks allows us to have art shows and to gather again. I'm all for it because I miss that stuff, man. I miss yeah. seeing my friends. I miss seeing new art. I miss like that culture of DC. Oh, I just miss it so much. Some, someone geniusly came out with one, which is like really simple. It's like a double layer mask. So it's like mostly here. And then there's a little thing here, but you can fit a straw inside the mask, like in between the two. Interesting. Yeah. So now you can actually go out drinking with other people and still you know, are you, whatever. Are you, are you saying you're, you're going to drink your beer with a straw? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I'll just have a beer in my studio. Like, I don't need to, I don't need to deal with all the, that. Like, I've got too much to do anyways. Like, that's one. I think the, one of the biggest things as an artist is like, people are like, yeah, like, I want to do this or that, but then like go to brunches or happy hours or bars or whatever. I'm just like, I canceled that out a long time. You're, talk, you're talking about discipline. I'm talking, yeah, like I canceled that out a long time ago. And it's just me personally, because I feel like the more time I work, the more work I'm going to have and the more I'm going to get out there. But it's like the amount of stuff you have to do as an artist, not just making work, but you have to do everything like proposals and budgets and this and that and the other. Like I have to like planning the mural festival is a, a whole year. You know, it takes me a long time to do it. And it's like a whole entire job that I don't get paid for that I have to sit there and work every year on all the time and make connections and figure out walls and figure out artists and figure out how to make this succeed. But it's at the end of the day, it's like, it's worth it because it brings me happiness and like the same thing. How do you my balance art. that? How do you balance that and a family? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Does it all just mesh into one? Like it just, yeah. it all just becomes one giant thing. I just like, accept it. I just do it. And like, the thing is, is that if you don't just do it, like it's not going to get done. Like if you, you like if somebody emails you like don't put it off just get it, like answer them back and like figure it out. But at the end of the day, if I don't plan it, if I don't jump ahead and like even like I was very very lucky like for this is the weird thing to say for coronavirus is that I normally hold the festival in May, mm -hmm. and I had decided last year that I was going to move the festival to the fall in October wow. because we always get rained out every May like it's beautiful weather but we get rained out. And it sucks. So as soon as I made that decision, because there's so much work you have to put into it to build up. If I had planned for May, 
March and April, I would have been done. Like it would have been, the festival would have been canceled. It would have been over. Yeah, it would have been pushed back anyways. No one would have came out and it yeah. would have been a big clusterfuck. Yeah, but now I, after experiencing everything, learning everything, like I know I can pull this off in October. It's going to be a different format, but the thing is, is that it's still going to be something that I can sit there and help do something for the community and bring some joy and some life back that make everybody safe, help them work safe. But at the end of the day, like, give them something to go to because there's nothing happening. There's no concerts. There's no this. The people can't go out. So if I can make some murals happen and get some artists like going and like things like that, then it's worth it. You know, like it'll be good. And like, we can have something we can make. Out. I love your insight on that because, you know, one of the things why I was so excited to have you on the show is because like you're operating at such a high level for an artist. Like you, mm. you're, you're, you're exhibiting uh, at least before Corona anyways, <laughs> around the world. Like you're, you're running a power, which is a whole separate business from running your own business mm. as an artist. Mm. Like, and then you even have that whole Holy bones thing mm. um, where I guess it, it, you bring other artists in and whatever. I don't, I you, like, you're, you're a busy man. And so it's still <laughs> interesting to hear how you sort of juggle all these things to get and still find time and not go crazy. It's like, it's kind of cool. Discipline. Yeah. It's just really like most, of the, I, I think most people see artists as like, it's crazy lackadaisical, like, just like in their own world like coffee shops or whatever the fuck like like it's not like that and i think it's not like that for for a lot of us or, mm -hmm. and, and you have to like you have to really find out how to make yourself happy doing it but i love being this busy because if i wasn't as busy i wouldn't know what to do with myself but at the end of Watch the day anime. like oh uh, no really well, I, can, I watch anime while I'm sketching. So it's even like, even Perfect. like one of those things, if I'm doing an illustration, I can still watch anime. It's just like, I'm popping my head up every once in a while. But at the end of it, like it's, it's, you have to really be disciplined. Like even, even me and my wife, like as soon as we had our son, we learned that we had to be really militant about our schedules and figure everything out and stuff like that. Cause my wife's like a genius. She's like, dude, she's like, a badass too, man. You guys are the craziest, most powerful I've ever seen. Yeah. She's got two retail stores and she's like made it happen. She hasn't had to lay anybody off. She's like actually been hiring wow. people. And like, wow. she's, she's a badass. And it's like, at the end of the day, like we have to, we had to figure it, sit down and like, I mean, we sweated like everyone else, you know, like we like, what the hell, like this fucked everyone up. But like, we had to sit down and say, okay, which are, what's our priorities accomplish that and then move on. And then it started opening back up and things figured out. But at the end of the day, it's just like, if I don't work and I don't make work, I can't support my family. Mm. Like I can't be that, that half of my, my relationship with my wife and bring in my, my support and like what I'm supposed to do. So you have to figure it out. Like you, you just have to hustle as hard as you can. And like, that's the thing. Like Instagram makes it look easy. You know, it really it makes, it's, it, it's instantaneous. It's it glamorizes instant, it all. Yeah, instant gratification. And it's cool. I like that. But, like, it's also cool is, like, people are really into seeing time lapses and how things process mm -hmm. and how you make things. And But, like, it's the things that people don't see. Like, like I said, the proposals, the talks, the meetings, the conversations, the budgets, and all that other shit. They don't want to see that. No one wants to see that. They're like, that's boring. Look, it's necessity. You have to. You have to learn it. Like, it's like one of those things, like, you have to learn to be a businessman business person mm -hmm. I apologize. but you have to learn to be a business person and figure out how to do it all because unless someone else is going to do it for you for free or for whatever like you have to do it all you have to figure out how to be a photographer you have to figure out be an accountant you have to figure out how to x y and z and like get it all done how did how did you start figuring it all out like how did you like as you've sort of progressed like how did you sort of put these pieces together to realize like oh shit it is about business because i've seen some artists who have shitty art but they're great business people and they get tons of work yeah and, <laughs> advice, and on the opposite spectrum i've seen artists with amazing work but they're the worst marketers they yeah. they don't know what they're doing and they're just yeah. gonna die in their mom's basement i'm just like so it's it, it, there's like this weird balance game there yeah i think it's it, like really it is no one can teach it. Like, it's just like, you have to get put into the situation of figuring it out. You have to put, get put in the situation where you get screwed over. You have to put in the, yourself in all these situations and be like, oh God, I'm never working with blah, blah again. This is like the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. And like, it's like one of those things where like, you just have to, you have to do like thinking that you know it all is complete garbage. Like you, like I'm always learning. I always still feel like an underdog. Like I, I'm, I'm not at the point where I want to be. I still want to do this, but I have projects that I want to do that I need to manifest. But it's just like, unless 
you just keep pushing as hard as you fucking can. Like no one's going to do it for you. That's don't be a, facts. don't be a bitch. Just fucking do it. Just fucking do the work. And like, that's the thing you sacrifice. Like that's for me. Like I sacrifice like used to like no one's doing it now. Brunches, bars. Like I used to go out to the bar all the time. And then I realized as soon as I like stopped doing all that shit, and put focus on my thing, I was able to produce 10 times more work, make 10 times more sales and get 10 times more shit done. And, and, and accomplish just, those things you wanted. Like, like now all of a sudden you're getting that show, you're getting that extra yeah. money to go to Japan where you get that extra inspiration. Like, it's, like you said, it sort of compounds on itself. Yeah, and you have to do it because if you come up with a crazy idea, it'd be like, I want to paint like this series of purple elephants. Like you have to buy the canvases and make the stuff and do all the things, but then you have to do the pricing and like you have to sell it. And like, that's that artist thing of where I think like I said, Instagram, people make it look instantaneous or something like that. Like when people get in that complacent mindset of being like, well, I make amazing art. So people should just buy it and do stuff for me already. Like, Oh God, it doesn't work like that. Like the, they're not reaching out and asking. I always think like the biggest thing is, is along the lines of what you said is, is just like taking those risks, asking, producing your art show, not sure if someone's going to come up, you know, and not yeah. sure if someone's going to go, they might not, you might fail, but you can't let that stop. So like you have to keep, that yeah. sort of hustle mentality. And it's kind of ironic the whole time you're saying that literally behind your head, it says fail, right behind <laughs> fail you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which I think a lot of people will, you have to do at some point like in, in the yeah. journey of getting to wherever it is you want to go. But I think, yeah, it's like an investment. Like you make a show, mm -hmm. you're investing money. And like, that's what I do now though. I just work. I don't work to make a show. If it turns into a show, cool. But the thing mm -hmm. is, is like, I want to make work. And a lot of people hit me up a lot of the times where they'll buy my work before I can get it out to make a show. So <laughs> it's a good it's, problem. <laughs> it, it is a good problem. But the thing is, is what, what's even more wild is that you have to build that body of work to make the show and it's an investment and you have to figure out where's that money come from. And like even being more creative is like being like, I don't have money to do that right now. Translating what you want to do into something that is viable, that will work for you, mm. that works on your budget. So say you don't have money to go out and buy like what I'm doing with a bunch of tile pieces and do this and that, but then like smart doing pieces on paper. Like it's like the, the simplest thing. Like you don't have to do something crazy like that. You don't have to do these wild projects, but build up to it. But mm -hmm. it's like, you can make anything. Like there's so many digital artists these days that like just an iPad and a pencil, but you still have to buy that iPad. Well, if you don't have an iPad, then just start doing it manually, like making drawings regular and like, well, it's the excuses. It's the excuses that people make that really piss yeah. me off. Especially me in the photography world, people always have the excuses. Oh, if only I had this camera. Oh, I don't have the best models. Oh, I don't. Yeah. I don't have access to this. I'm just like, dude. Like, there's people who literally have careers shooting on their iPhone. Yeah. And and you're complaining because you don't have like 30 more megapixels, or you're complaining because you don't you you can't afford this like hundred dollar canvas it's like well if, if you really want it like uh you know yeah. basquiat sold postcards for five dollars in a park and walked yeah. and then he walked up to andy warhol and in the gagosian guy and was like hey buy my shit like yeah you gotta have balls yeah that's that, that was basically my first solo show wait what? my first solo show was that kind of yeah i was in i was in uh i was coming out of college and my Okay, so basically during college, I, I, I started doing tour managing for bands and like I basically took a year and a half or a year off from school just to go on tour. And then I came back and the professors that I, were, I was in with were kind of pissed off at me that I just bailed because I was just like, I don't know. So when I came back, I wanted to get back into doing all these sculptural shit and like they basically said, no, just finish out your degree and like do your basic shit. So basically I just reverted from went to graffiti before college went to art school started doing art school shit and then basically reverted back to graffiti for my final like senior show because i was so pissed off that i was just like well fuck this i'm just gonna do this and then like during the senior show one of the professors like came up to me and he was like yeah this is cute but it's not gonna sell and blah blah and it was before i mean Damn. that's bef it's before instagram it's before all that shit and like before really it was just the time when graffiti culture was coming a little bit into art scenarios um it, it wasn't and, respected it like wasn't respected yeah, like pe people yeah, thought it when they thought of graffiti they were thinking of people bombing subways in new york right so basically what had happened is like after that i got nominated for like what was called a digital print portfolio and it was oh, wow. they were like okay you're gonna work with this 
digital print master. His name's David Adamson. And like they have a gallery and basically you get to do one print. And I had already been designing um, stuff for a while digitally. And I was a designer at Whole Foods for like 10 years. So basically I already knew what I wanted to do digitally. So I basically had a postal sticker that had graffiti. Like I just digitally graffitied it and then brought it. Like we, we came in, did the session. We had three eight hour sessions and I knocked it out in the first like 45 minutes, two hours or whatever of like the, my first session. And he was like, damn, he's like, do you want to come back for the other sessions and just make shit? And I was like, yeah. And it basically at the end of that, I reverted back to that first one. Cause I just did a, a kind of series of little stickers and it was dope. But then I came back with a bunch of just more like graffiti stickers and shit and said, Hey, remember that thing I did with you guys? If I do a solo show, like a bunch more of these, can I do a solo show here? He was like, yeah. Of like, the graffiti oh. stickers? Yeah. So I did massive like digital prints of these graffiti stickers. It's all digital show. Like Whoa. it was a digital prints. So they were all limited edition. And I didn't realize that when I was walking in and talking to him about asking for the solo show. And he said, yes, and we gave me a solo show. And then halfway through making the solo show, they said they wanted to represent me. That the people on their roster that they represented, were, there were only like 10 people. Chuck Close, Jim Dine, Jenny Holsler. Oh like Ooh. fucking mega superstars. And yeah. I was just like, I was on this weird totem pole. I was at the bottom, but I was on like the people that were repped. And I was like, holy shit. Like how, how, like, I don't understand. And then I had a second solo show with them. And like, then they shut down the gallery a couple of years later and everything. And it was a great experience, but like people come up to me and they say, how do you get your start? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. Like, it's the same thing. Like, I don't know. Like you, you just like have balls and you just try to go for it. But like, you don't do it in a dickhead way. But like, literally you just like, I didn't realize like showing graffiti stickers to the guy and being like, Hey, can I do a solo show? If I do more of these, I think it'd be cool. And then, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like yeah. someone could have easily been like, Oh, this is silly. There's no way yeah. like, you were just like, now let me just ask this yeah. dude. And then my first solo show almost completely sold out. And it was crazy. I was just like, Whoa. yeah, it was wild. It was, but it was like one of those things. It was like merging my, my world and my culture into theirs. Like, I had friends, like, I would go to the Black Cat all the time and drink, and I had my friend Arnold, who was a bartender at Black Cat, just serve 40s at my solo show because they weren't used to that culture. R.I.P. Black just, Cat. <laughs> yeah, so we were just, like, serving 40s at the solo <laughs> show. Dude, I love that. 40s at an art show. Dude, that sounds like the most lit art show ever. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's, it's like, the way, you know, you should do it. You do it how you feel and how you warrant it and everything like that, but it's the same thing. I'm not comparing myself to Basquiat, but it's, like, a funny story because, like, I never... I never would think that I would never think like that's, that's an impossible thing to do. It's like showing someone you were in a, in a decent manner and thinking you can get a solo show out of it or doing something. But like, it's, it's that culture th these days though, where people don't put in work because mm. I had put in a ton of work before that to get to that point of just even mastering a craft of thinking like I can digitally create this in two seconds because I had put in the work learning how to do that process. Or just try. It's like those building blocks built, built upon each other to where you won that, uh, I guess, position to even have the opportunity to let alone ask. It's like, yeah. it's like these little incremental things that you told along that story that makes sense. It's, it's not just like, Oh, I had a solo show to this guy who represented Chuck Close. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't, you didn't see all the other shit before that, that Instagram exactly. didn't show you. And, yeah, and, put it more. And, yeah. Was that the first time when you had that show? Like that, like a bell went off and you're like, Oh shit. Like maybe I can do this. Like, was that like a big yeah, moment for you? It, it was. And it was also a big moment that the professor came to the show came to the opening and yes he i love that he apologized no way yeah he apologized. Did, um, that's but it was great. it was uh no it, it was an eye-opener for sure my first solo show went great my second one kind of tanked and it was like my own fault because i got cocky but it was like that mm -hmm. lesson i learned was like oh like don't don't hold yourself like always believe you that that was literally the name of my first show was underdog and like Ooh. always hold yourself to 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 that like never never sit down and think you're you're the best like always think that you're you've got to come up and do everything you can man. like you have to hustle as hard as you can why do you think your second one tanked what happened cocky i got cocky it was it wasn't anything other than like i just it, i personally let myself down because i didn't put in as much work as i could have. Mm. and it's like those things where i was like younger and i was going out drinking all the time and i just i could have put 10 times more work into it and i decided not to i decided it was like you know, do what I did, like, fuck everyone, blah, blah, blah. And then it wasn't, it wasn't a negative attitude towards people. It was just, like, my attitude of just, like, going off and having fun and whatever. But, like, now I enjoy putting in 10 times as much work 
as I can because I realize the results. Dude, I, I see think it. most people would have done that shit. You're in your 20s, you just had your first sold out art show. Like you're on top yeah. of the world. You're like, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. I can, I can throw shit at a wall. Someone's yeah. going to buy it. Exactly. And it's that, I love that attitude, but it's also at the same sense, like, it, like if I had realized earlier that if I just put my head down and work and work and work and work and work, it shows. It really does. It's like, there's nothing more I can say, but it's like, especially during this time, where people can't go out to bars and you can't go to brunches and whatever, you should put your head down and work and work and work yeah. and work. And you'll see like, all right, work on your portfolio. All right, work on your website. All right, work. And like, it could be any manifestation of a person's job in life. Like if you're, a, I don't know, a hairstylist, like figuring out new techniques, like figuring out this, fuck, like the people that learned how to make sourdough bread or this, like learn a new fucking language. You know what I'm saying? Like, like better yourself. Like they're, they're, you have every opportunity. You got 45 minutes to take a language like podcast and learn how to speak who's yeah, you got you got dueling yeah. you, you can take a shit and learn spanish like it's kind of crazy. <laughs> exactly so it's you, just like it's it, that's that's just my personal my personal ethic you know like that how do i do it it's just like work 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 like i mean it clearly works right like, yeah it, and and this is maybe a lofty question but what is it that you're working to because from my perspective you've done so much but what is that for you joy I mean, like, it's oh, just, yeah. like, it All brings right. me happy. There's no, I mean, money's money, you know, like you can mm -hmm. make money and blow money and like whatever. And, like at the end of the day, like it's also cool getting new toys and like playing with new things that make art and whatever. But like at the end of it, it's just like, I love making work. I love getting out there. I love that people want to support me. I love like that when I'm humbled by like people wanting to buy my work and they, they say, Hey, I'm, I really love your stuff. I, I've been wanting to get this for a while. It, like it's really wild. Like, it's really wild for someone to say that to me all the time. Like, I'm, I'm never used to it because, like, at the end of the day, they're supporting my family. They're supporting me. They're supporting my career. And, like, I will never, ever take it, take that for granted, ever. And it's just, like, one of those things, like, it just brings me joy to, like, keep doing what I'm doing. Mm. Like, there's always an end goal of somebody making money and making rent. And I understand that. I'm in that game. But at the end of it, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're in the wrong fucking job. It's like what Gary Vaynerchuk says, love the process. Yeah. Got the process. I mean, it's like, of course, oh, sorry, sorry, what were you going to say? The, the solo shows are the end process, but like sometimes the solo show, like the, having the shows, like they're, they're not as cool as making everything. Mm -hmm. Because like you have those epiphany moments. You have those like wild things. You're just like, oh my God, why didn't I do this earlier? But like it's still that epiphany or, oh my God, I love where this is going or, oh, oh this is a fucking mistake. But like you, you relish yeah. in like burning yourself and making the mistakes. It's like that's the, like the, those are those things. It's life. Like it's the same thing. But it's like, if you don't, like, it's a very Japanese ethic. It's like, if you don't love your job, find something else you want to do in life and do that. Make yourself happy. Because that's the only way, if you're just stuck in a dead end job, don't do it. You I, don't think that's, I think that's something that a lot of people have realized during this quarantine yeah. is, is they, like, they uh, assessed what they were doing. They, and they were like, wait a minute, like, I really don't enjoy being an accountant. Sure. I really don't. I, you know, when I was like 16, I really enjoyed putting together those plastic Gundams. I really enjoyed like sure. doing whatever. And I, I used to put together a lot of plastic Gundams. That shit was sick. <laughs> but like, but like, you know, like I feel like a lot of people I see either on social or personally, they're having these sort of epiphany moments where they're reflecting on what they really value in life. Yeah. And, but it's, it's that thing is that like people like, I understand the mentality of someone's working a job and there's like, I can't not work my job. I can't, mm -hmm. I want to do skydiving for a living and I can't just not work. I'm just like, well, it's like, cool. are you happy? Are you happy though? Yeah. It's are you happy. But the thing is, is like, are you putting in effort to mm. change that? Like, I understand that. But like when people get off their job, they go home, like they chill out, watch TV and then like, you know, play Xbox and then they go to sleep and like, whatever. It's just like, all right, you could cancel out all that other shit and then put in work and then you can manifest it. Cause I had to do the same thing. I had to sit there just because I had art shows doesn't mean I didn't have to work a job. I worked as a designer for 10 years at Whole Foods. Then I went and did real estate uh, ad graphics, which was horrible. And then like I walked the dogs and fucking bartended and did all the fucking gnarly jobs. That, Dude, I'm so like, glad you said that. I'm so glad yeah. you, that you said that you did those other things. Yeah. I, I like me and my wife both, like we hustled our asses off. And the thing is I never stopped doing art. Like I, I would take like time to figure out how to make it, work and then it got to the point where my last job was bartending and i would just figure out like i would just keep making work and keep making work where i had to stop scheduling so many shifts 
by the end of it, I could only do one, one day a week. And at that point I was just like, well, fuck it. There's no other, there's no point of doing one day a week. If I'm only gonna make 60 bucks when I can do whatever and make like 200. So as soon as I quit that job and put a thousand percent more effort into where not, not having to do that eight hour shift or whatever it was, I saw results immediately. I figured so it's like, it's like a, a weird fucking infomercial. Like I saw results immediately. Like I immediately figured, you stopped your job, quit your job. Yeah. yeah. It, it was that, it was that epiphany moment where it was just like, holy shit. Why didn't I fucking do this early? If I put 10 times more effort, mm. 10 times more thing and, and busting my ass to figure out how to do this better, I would be able to do this all the time. And it just like, that was like 10 years ago. And it's just like one of those things. It's just like, you have to have those moments. Like you have to, you have to, trudge through life and figure out well, what do I do what do I do how do I learn how do I learn and then just fucking do it it's crazy and I'm, no one, and I'm, so and no one you, and I'm so glad you brought up that you work those other jobs because that's yeah. the part on Instagram that people miss that, that people don't talk about that like along this whole interview someone could have thought you just you know had these awesome art shows and you made it this whole time so that's why I was like oh I'm so glad you said that because it's like the humanizing element where it's like dude it's like you know don't just quit your job. You haven't even had a show. You haven't even made a sale. Don't just quit your job. Like yeah, it's okay no. to walk. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. A lot. Most people that you see who are killing it and doing big things, they probably have some side hustle that they're not telling you about. Yeah. It's called weaning yourself off. Like mm -hmm. that, that's what I'm saying. Like you go from full time to part time to like no time and you're doing your full time now for yourself. And like, that's the thing. A lot of photographers have to figure that out of how to schedule clients, how to get other clients doing work that they necessarily don't want to do. But Facts. all of a sudden it pays the bills. It's the truest thing in the world. I've had so many commissions where like when I was younger, like people would be like, yeah, I want you to paint like the, this obey giant thing. And I'm like, that's stealing. I'm not going to fucking paint that. Like you, 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 you draw those lines and figure it out. But then there's other clients that came along and said, yeah, I would love a mural of my dog in this style and da, da, da. I'm like it's not really my steez but I'm gonna do it because I need money dude and I can't tell like, you how many stupid shoots I've done for couples and, and yeah. wedding shits I'm just like, all right I just need the money it's there's stuff that you do you don't want to do and there's stuff that you you really you you do it because it's in the vein of what you can do it's in your thing but like at the end of the day like if you can get to that point where you can you can wean yourself off all of it and you just 100 percent put in effort it works. And like, that's what I said about giving back to my community. Cause like I wouldn't be shit without that. And after mm -hmm. having do that, like I've, I've come up from a broken home. I've come up from busting my ass, hustling a job. I was homeless at one point, like wow. really fucking stupid shit. But the, at the end of the day, I'm not focused on those stories. I'm not focused on all that shit. I'm focused on hustling as hard as I can and making myself happier and making my family happier. You know, like it, I keep saying, like, you can't change anyone else. You can only change yourself. And at the end of the day, like, even someone listening to this, like, I'll never be able to tell them how hard to hustle or whatever. It's up to them, you know, whoever else to, to really put in that effort. And, like, it doesn't happen overnight. Like, I wish mm -hmm. it did. That would be fantastic. That'd be you know? great. Jesus. I, I wish I could post today on Instagram and all of a sudden <laughs> uh, freaking Vogue hits me up to do a cover shoot. That'd be dope. Have you reached out to Vogue yet? Nah, 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 Why? nah, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm saying reach out, see what's up. Well, so, so personally, like that, that used to be my goals at one point and that would still be nice. But as I've gotten more into like YouTube content and the podcast and, yeah. and doing my own art exhibitions, I, I can't really say that it's my priority to be like a Vogue fashion photographer. Right. Yeah. I mean, but it's like, like it, your goals change all the time, you know, like, that's, that's what, what I'm saying. Like, doesn't it like i i love knowing that i love getting older i really really do there's a lot of people what? that hold on to that that mythology of not aging like my hair is getting gray like i understand it but like it doesn't change the fact that like the knowledge that i've gained from my life like immeasurably have helped change me and make me a better person i believe and like mm -hmm. that's what i love i love that process of going through this and like knowing because there's like not me but there's people that are called masters for a reason. They've gone through their entire lives figuring out one simple thing. Like that's the same thing, like the job thing, the Japanese ethic of like, give a thousand percent to your job. If you love it, yeah. do it a thousand. It's such, like a, it's such like a cool Japanese concept. It's a concept yeah. of being a master of one thing. Like the guy who rolls the best sushi, makes the best rice. Like the, yeah. it, that, that culture promotes this mastery of like a one individual thing. I think I've always thought that was so cool. Yeah, Euro Dreams of Sushi, right? Like the that guy. I mean, yeah, that's a that's a great one. Yeah, it's it's but like before his movie, 
like I guarantee he was busy, right? After that thing came out and they, they did it, like, God, you can't even get in there now. Like, he's, like this, and they, they took away the Michelin stars as well. Like he's, well, they took it away for a reason. It's because an average person cannot go in there and eat a meal. That's the reason oh for Michelin stuff. <laughs> you know, I've got problems with Michelin star because why is a tire manufacturer making a guide about food? I'm just saying. That's well, that's what weird. they say. They say that as well. They said, we're just a tire company. The, the food guide is not, is not what we're about. We're just a tire company. But then all of a sudden it turned into this whole thing where, you know, now they have secret food people that go in and judge you. Like, people whatever. are so scared of it, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> is that a reviewer? Is that yeah. a food blogger? Like, we got to, we got to make sure. God, that's a sick job. I want to be a food blogger. I don't even want to be a food blogger. I just want to be a food reviewer and say whether it sucks or not. Like, you, don't, you, don't even have, you don't even have to do that. You know DC food porn? Oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah, yeah. Seem, He's not even reviewing it. He's just breaking the shit in half and showing you how gooey the chocolate chip is. Like, he's not out there, like, saying it's good so or bad. Smart. I he love took, it. He took, like, the, the highway on that one. That's brilliant. I Like, if you can do that and make your life easier and your job easier. That's what I'm saying. You, even that, you have to master that. Like, you have to master, like, out sure. of how, what's the best shot? What's the best thing? Like, what's the best cookie? crumble thing i don't know but like at the end of the day that's a good point that's a good point it's like yeah. you don't job shit looks that goes really easy it. but i'm sure he yeah. does a lot of back-end stuff a lot of stuff just to get that one shot to yeah. get that one slow-mo drippy gooey cookie i make yeah. me hungry thinking about that shit yeah no i'm definitely gonna eat lunch right after this that's oh dude that's same man <laughs> i really starving dude, th- th- but, this is this is kind of uh going back to what you said earlier yeah do you and this is something that i wonder now in today's do you do you think it's still relevant for artists to go to school for art? Like, is that still a practical relevant mm-hmm. thing for someone for going from high school, thinking about, you know, their, their life and their progression towards being a full-time artist? I get asked that. Um, I'm 50, 50. There's, there's definitely knowledge in having someone sit down with you and show you something. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is there's no, I've never seen a real good art curriculum that shows the entire thing of what it's manifested into now. Cause it's always changing, mm-hmm. but showing how you need to, use Instagram showing how you need to be a business person showing how you like whatever because all the time like you have to look at it comparatively and, and competitively the people that are teaching you are artists just because they're an art professor doesn't change the fact that they're artists and this is their supplementary job to help them get through life while they're making art you know what I'm hope saying so. at least you hope so yeah but I mean even a lot of my friends they, they're artists and they've done art things and I applaud mm-hmm. them it's not like I'm saying this is about them I'm saying this is what I experienced when I went to school is that they don't tell you this super duper cool secrets about grants or this some, maybe you'll get a grant class and you'll learn about it. But those people are going after those grants or this and that the other well as competitively as you are. So why would they give you a leg up on those type of things? And like, that was one of the things I experienced. That's interesting. In yeah. That's really, it's yeah, interesting. Because, you're competing with your professors in a weird way. In a very weird way, because what if you're like really baller at making art and they're just like mildly average and then all of a sudden like you realize that like they're going after the same grant you are and you get it and then all of a sudden there's an animosity. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really a weird dynamic, but it's also in the same sense as like there's stuff in colleges like you can't learn without going to it. So like you can't get a medical degree without going to college. You can't become a lawyer without going to college. But there are certain things like being an artist, you can definitely fucking do it. Are there, are there like certain techniques or certain other advantages of going to art school that would maybe be more of a pro like that? Was- well, that's what I'm saying. Like, they, they, like it's required for you to take a ton of different things. So like you can take painting and you take sculpture and you take printing and you take these things and you learn the basic rudimentaries of it. And then you figure out which one you want to do. Because when you're an artist and you go to art school, it's like I, I've found like everybody emulates as soon as they get there, they want to be a Jackson Pollock or they want to be a cause or they want to be a this or that and the other. And they go down that route of emulating. And some people don't take the time to break away from that emulation. And that's why other people are like, oh, look what you're doing. It looks just like this. And well, it's because that's what the point of college is, practicing and figuring shit out. But, or, like, or worse, what I'm scared of is, is some artist is gifted and college tries to mold them into something they're not. Truth. Yeah. But it's like also like I don't, like we have this conversation, me and my wife about telling our son, like you go to middle school, you go to high school and then you go to college. It's like, you don't have to follow that path. You like really don't because like during the, the, the age now of information, you can get everything almost entirely online. Facts. It's, it's whether you want to do it and learn because like you can learn everything you want about silkscreen online. But 
like learning the tips, the tricks and stuff is like really when you have a person that's with the knowledge sitting in front of you or whether you do an internship or whether you go to school for it. Mm-hmm. It's like one of those figuring out how to make it work when you don't know how to. And like, the, but that's the thing that I'm saying, like, look at what quarantine did. How many people became a gardener? How many people became a, a baker? How many people became this? Like, you don't need that yeah. kind of shit. Like, you can learn how to paint watercolors with Bob Ross. Like, yeah, you don't have to go out to eat. You could stay home and cook. You could, you could do. You don't need the gym. You could just go run and find a tree branch, do some pull ups, like I've been doing. Yeah, exactly. And then, well, like, that's the amazing thing that people are going to learn through like this whole thing is like, like this has given you self sufficient evidence that you can make it without having to go to college or having but, to go to school. But also it's scary to think to tell some artist, which is already a hard job when you're starting is like, Hey, go strap up with some debt just to get out and have to work that yeah. part-time job probably even longer to pay off that debt. And, yeah. and I find that sense. it does make sense to me, especially from my photography background, where if looking back, if I was like, all right, Bruce, you wanted to go to college for photography, I would have yeah. told him, to, to go in an intern for someone and not go to college. I've been like, yo, that'd have been yeah. a way better experience. You could have progressed a lot faster than if you went to school for four years. Yeah. And, and like, I mean, car mechanics, like nine tenths of the time, you just have to go be a mechanic. Like you go, like people like, Oh, well, you know, didn't have to go to school for you. Just became a mechanic. Well, you had to learn like some way, shape or form. It's just like, like, that's how you find, like, you, I, I, I think it's amazing when people do certain things and they realize that what they want to do with, with their job is, comes later in life it's not what they found in the beginning mm-hmm. that's always the truest thing i think as well as college because someone goes like i went to college for to become a lawyer and then i turned into an artist it's just like all right cool like that's right wow. but i mean like it's just like yeah do you want to rack up 40 60 80 100 thousand dollars worth of debt that carries you and stays with you the rest of your fucking life well or, it's even it's even more wild to think that like those lectures are literally on youtube they're literally online you could watch those same lectures someone's paying yeah. and even now the person's going to virtual school which is even yeah. more wild to me and they're still paying the same amount i'm like is this is this going to be the crash of the college system is yeah. this moment where people kind of wake up a little bit i hope so personally but yeah I think it's a 50 50 too. Cause like you can have anybody jump on there saying they're an expert or something. And then all of a sudden it comes around, they don't know oh, shit about shit. And they get that's called. true. That's very true. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, like I said, like just trying to be positive, going through life, trying to be a better person. But like for me, you just like hustling and trying to be a better artist all the time. You know, it's a, it's like, it's a rad, it's a rad world we live in. Even, even with these crazy days, like I'm still, I mean, I'm really excited to see what comes out of this because like, you know, our generation, this generation, the generation before me, whatever, no one's gone through what we're going through right now. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, the world's been fucked a bunch of times. Like we've had like, they've had like in Europe, they had like, what, like 2 million die from uh, the what is it, Spanish influenza or whatever it was. Like, like the black plague or yeah, something crazy like, like that. Yeah. 200 million, 200 million. <sighs> That's insane. Like that, this is, this is a drop in the bucket. It's not great, but like, this is nothing compared to like shit like that. Or, or even what's happening in like China right now. And if people don't really think about it, but the whole Hong Kong government, also, that stuff is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, Portland, I don't know. Like there's shit. Oh, going yeah. on. That's just crazy too, man. That's yeah, a lot of like, like, worms. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on in this world. And like very, very lucky to be in DC, like very lucky to, to have like the numbers be real low, very lucky for our community to support each other. Very lucky for a lot of this shit. And we'll just see what the future holds. But like, for me and my wife and my son, like very positive about the future. Like very, like I'm excited to see the amount of creative stuff like come out, but like how much better, like we can be as a city and as a society coming out. Well, also man, city DC is lucky to have someone like you here. So I mean, (laughs) on behalf of everyone, thanks dude. Like like I put on for my city. You know, you've inspired me and and who knows how many other people to like do cool shit. And especially after like talking to you here, man, I'm like, ah, I get it. Like I get it. I'm stoked. I'm I'm just happy to to be able to shoot the shit. You know, it was fun. So, dude, awesome. Having. Yeah, man. Really appreciate you coming on. And uh, guys, yeah. anyone listening, if you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, all that bullshit, and uh, connect with him on Instagram, Kelly Tolls, whole nine yards, and it's Tolls T O W L E S. All right, that's it. Yeah. That's the angle. Peace out, guys. Thanks.